Welcome to Technovation. I'm your host, Peter High. My guest today is Duran Asamoglu. Duran is the Elizabeth and James Killian Professor of Economics at MIT. He's also an institute professor, the highest faculty honor at MIT. Duran is the 2005 winner of the John Bates Clark Medal given to an American economist under the age of 40, who is judged to have made a significant contribution to economic thought and knowledge. It's one of many honors he's received. Duran is also an elected fellow at the National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the British Academy of Sciences, among other prestigious bodies. He's the author of five books, including his latest, Power and Progress, Our Thousand-Year Struggle Over Technology and Prosperity, which he co-authored with Simon Johnson. I look forward to gaining insights from across Duran's areas of expertise and curiosity through this conversation. Duran, welcome to Technovation. It's great to speak with you today. Thank you, Peter. It's uh, my true pleasure to be here with you. Well, uh, Daron, as uh, you and I were speaking about uh, just a moment ago, I, I would love to understand your thought process in developing your latest book. Uh, it is a a, a wonderful uh, historical perspective of, of innovation, uh, of progress, but also um, of the issues associated with it in a variety of different different directions as well. And, and I wonder, you know, as you thought about uh, the technology and prosperity, why the thousand year view of this as opposed to focusing only on the more recent? Well, thank you, Peter. That's actually, you know, uh, really at the heart of it and the reason why we wrote the book. It is meant to be a counterweight to a blind techno optimism that is quite prevalent nowadays, while at the same time celebrating technology. And I started in this journey, believing like many economists that technological progress is the root cause of the tremendous improvements in living standards, health conditions, uh, income that we have experienced. We are extremely fortunate to be living at the beginning of the 21st century, rather than say in the middle of the 18th century. And technological progress is the main driver of that benefit. But a lot of my work shows things are not so rosy when it comes to new technologies being introduced in the US labor market today. And whenever that sort of issue comes up, a standard question is, are you sa saying this time is different? Because in the past, things have been always great. It is true that we are the beneficiaries of that long development path. But there was nothing automatic about it. And this time is no different if you look at history. And that's the reason why we delve into the thousand year history is because there is a constant struggle over technology. Who's going to benefit from it? Different narratives about technology and who controls technology. And that's the reason why the book is about today. But it is a historical book. A very, very interesting perspective. And of the many historical uh, references you have, uh, one related to Ferdinand de Lesseps, so I found particularly compelling. Uh, and I wonder if you could take a quick moment and provide a background into him as to, and, and why you included his story uh, in the book. I think de Lesseps, as well as some of the other discussions we have in the book, captures the complex nature of techno leaders and techno optimism. De Lesseps was a charismatic, inspiring figure a sort of techno-optimist of his day, who spearheaded the tremendous success at the Suez Canal when many other people thought that politically it wasn't possible to convince different policymakers to have a canal at Suez, and they thought technology would not be up for it. And he always said, you know, men of genius would rise to the occasion and find the right techniques to solve the problem. And he also believed in commerce and technology-fueled growth, and that's why he was so keen on building the Suez Canal, because he thought that there would be tremendous demand for shipping through, uh, through, the, uh, through there. But the same sort of perspectives, what we call vision, that fueled his determination and turned out to be quite useful for his success at Suez, also made him blind to the different conditions and the bigger challenges at Panama. And he went to Panama with an unrealistic, unworkable plan, convinced other people because he had much greater charisma as a result of his success. And his techno-optimism became widespread despite the fact that it was not based on good foundations in Panama. And it was a complete disaster. It led to the deaths of 
uh, it led to the death of 22,000 people. Plans were abandoned. Things were delayed. Much, much later, different strategies were necessary for making the uh, canal at Panama a reality. So he sort of captures that success together with blindness that I think is a hallmark of many technological leaders in the past and today. And and uh, together with that, the the notion that success breeds hubris or overconfidence to a great extent as well, and, and something that is certainly a warning for some of the extraordinarily successful entrepreneurs and leaders today who, you know, continue to pivot into different directions as a result of, and, and with great confidence as a result of, of past success. That certainly is also another theme or thread that runs through the, the, the dialogue as well. Yeah, who would have thought that success in building electric cars would make you such a great leader of a social media company, for example? <laughs> I don't know who you're speaking about there. But I, I, I have no idea. Yeah, <laughs> I take the fifth. There you go. Exactly. Uh, so, I mean, part of what you're you're describing is also kind of a warning against blind optimism as well. Uh, you right. talk about how technological progress is neither necessary necessary nor sufficient for economic progress. Uh, you note that from windmills to cotton gins to to more modern technology, in many cases, perhaps most, the advantages go to the few rather than to the many. And right. I think, uh, yeah, so, please. absolutely, Peter. Yes, yes. I mean, I would say it's not sufficient, definitely not sufficient. In fact, it's a protracted struggle. But we do view technological progress as the most important engine of broad-based prosperity. So if we're going to have... Uh, a capability to improve the living conditions of millions of people in the United States, billions of people around the world. Technological progress has to play a central role. But that makes us even more determined to have a fundamental debate about whether technology is going in the right direction, because it has great potential. Think of generative AI, for example. It has tremendous potential. It's a really inspiring, perhaps awe-inspiring technology. But if it goes in the wrong direction, which we believe right now it is, that has huge damage consequences, damaging consequences, but it also has this big missed opportunity because we could have used it for something much better. And, and in many ways, I, uh, the, the, the title of your book is, of course, Power and Progress. And uh, it, there's a balance between those two, right? Um, and, and I wonder if you could maybe just uh, take a moment and describe why you've spoken about it as such, why, why you titled the book uh, that way, and how you think about the interplay between power as well as progress. Well, you know, I think both words there have a, a, a double meaning. Progress, you know, is both technological progress and broader social progress, and the two may not need to be the same. So, you know, the first time we use progress or the second time it's in uh, inverted qu quotation marks, is that really progress for humanity if we have much bigger nuclear weapons? That's an obvious question. It's a rhetorical question. But power too, you know, first of all, that's who has social power? Who gains greater social power and greater say about the future of society, the future of inequality, the future of technology? But also technology is in intertwined with humanity's power dominance over nature. So we start the book with a quote from H.G. Wells, who now I think more, almost 130 years ago in the time machine, I think captured it very well. And he said, we think of technology or progress as men's dominion over nature, but forget that it is often about men controlling men. And that is the theme throughout our book, that technology provides those who control it the power to improve things, but also the power to dominate others, gain all of the advantage, gain more power, create more inequality. And I think that's that balance that we have to struggle with all the time. And that's why it is a thousand year struggle that's both over technology and over prosperity. Yeah, very interesting insights. And as you call out, Daron, that that uh, technology innovation is essential uh, for progress. But um, what do you see as the counterbalances to the power accruing to relatively few? I um, mean, you you talk about uh, for very good reason about the 
diminution of influence of, of labor unions, for example, uh, uh, here in the United States. And in, in many ways, maybe the lack of effectiveness um, in recent years, needless to say, as well. Um, the role that government must play, perhaps, uh, and, and of course, the, the difficult difficulty of getting that right, overplay versus, uh, uh, versus a productive end to ensure that, uh, you know, the, 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 the worst possibilities are avoided. Um, how do you how do you think about that interplay of the variety of aspects of, of power in, or influence that might counterbalance what you've described? Well, you know, at the center of our book are two big conceptual blocks. One is countervailing powers. You know, if those who control technology and those to control corporations become so powerful that there are no barriers to stop them or slow them down, especially when they are going in directions that are harmful to the rest, that is not going to be a recipe for success. And the two kinds of, uh, you know, the three kinds of countervailing powers we emphasize are democracy, that's critical, you know, the struggles over technology wages, working conditions in Britain, for example, was very much centered on democratic rights in the 19th century. The second is worker voice. Technology is about work to some extent, to a great extent, and it is important to have worker voice, and that's typically been through trade unions. And again, in Britain, the bigger struggle, perhaps even than democracy, was about labor rights and uh, you know recognition of unions and their representation. The two were often intertwined. And then the third is regulation. You know, the government has played a very important role in the regulation of products for safety. Uh, for quality control, and also sort of broader sort of ideas about public good. So that's one sort of sort of the political, the power part. The, the, the nature of technology also matters greatly. And uh, the big idea there that we have is that contrary to what many, not all, but many economists believe, and many policymakers have taken from economists, there is no guarantee that new technologies that increase production will necessarily generate benefits for workers or that they will act like what we call the productivity bandwagon pulling other people. And the key is whether they're making workers more productive or increasing workers' contribution to production. And the big divide there is between automation, which is taking over tasks that were previously performed by workers, by humans, which tends to increase productivity, but also sideline workers versus creating new tasks, increasing the productivity of workers in the tasks that they are performing. And that those two have to be balanced. There's nothing wrong with automation. In fact, it's been a pretty important fuel for the broader economic rise of Western nations. But if automation is not counterbalanced by new things for workers to be centrally integrated into production process, then we get a very distorted set of outcomes. Very interesting. And it runs, you know, it offers a, offers a, a counterbalance to the opinion uh, among some economists who are economists, of course, of the virtue of free markets alone in helping to correct or, or develop the appropriate pathway forward. I mean, you highlight that those who are so optimistic about the, uh, the virtue of free markets uh that there are many you know historical and present examples of of the the problems with that theory absolutely yeah. and i think market fundamentalism has been costly for the united states for the uk you know there's no doubt in our minds that the market process is central for the correct allocation of resources but more importantly for innovation there have been a few exceptions but they've been very partial and leaving those aside, innovation, technological progress has been served by market competition. People motivated by status, profits, sales, pursuing their own vision of how to solve a problem or coming up with different ideas for new products, for new ways of doing things, that's been central. But that doesn't mean that the market process completely unfettered is going to hit the right balance between automation and new tasks, surveillance and worker empowerment, 
big corporations versus small corporations. There are so many different choices and they all have broad societal implications. That's why a regulatory framework is critical. And the one that we really focus on in the book is this automation versus new tasks uh, balance, which is very important for the future of work, future of inequality, and and quite honestly, actually, for the future of democracy. And I think, again, market fundamentalism doesn't serve us very well in that. As we have this conversation, and I'd love to get more into detail on generative AI, which, of course, has been all, all uh, one of the, the biggest new developments in, in the past uh, seven or eight months. Uh, I think I've heard of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, th I thought you might have. Uh, but as we have this conversation, we're just a few days uh, following uh, the Biden, uh, President Biden meeting with a number of CEOs of prominent technology organizations, um, in essence, having a bit of a rethink, a bit of a pause. And I wonder uh, what you think about that from what you've read in terms of uh, the, the wisdom of that, the uh, how realistic it is that that might lead to um, some sort of virtuous outcome relative to perhaps the um, how things were unfolding previously. Any, any opinions you're beginning to develop there? Well, absolutely. I mean, I think it's a big, big advance. You know, the Biden administration needs to be congratulated on achieving that. And and I think uh, the tech companies also are perhaps more amenable to regulation today than they were, say, a couple of years ago. Uh, you know, look at the attitude that, you know, social media leaders such as Mark Zuckerberg had 10 years ago versus Sam Altman. And I think some of it is changing political pressures. Some of it is personality, but there is a true change in recognition that regulation is critical. And this very, very powerful technology, and don't get me wrong, I think generative AI is amazing. It's really inspiring. It's really promising. So that very powerful technology can be misused. That being said, I see two problems, even, even though I celebrate this agreement. One is that still, the type of conversations that we are seeing will give the greater responsibility and power to the tech companies themselves. There's much more self-regulation than sort of a tight regulatory framework that is imposed on them, which I think is needed. You know, Sam Altman was asking for regulation, but also wanted to be the designer of that regulation. And there is a lot of... Uh, tendency to accept that among policymakers because of exactly the, the, the Lesseps problem. Sam Altman, just like the Lesseps, has huge success under his wings. And also, partly because of the market fundamentalism that you mentioned, we have not invested enough in regulatory expertise, regulatory muscle in the United States government, especially in the area of digital technologies. So it is natural for senators to say, oh, you know, why don't you come up with the regulations for yourself? <laughs> How well that worked for the financial sector. <laughs> but second, I think the current agreement focuses on the very important issues related to security safety. Those are central. I mean, Senate Intelligence Committee, for example, is very involved and should be on issues of generative AI, but questions that I think are as important about the future of work, how we're going to use this generative AI in corporations. Are we going to do more of the automation, which we've done a little bit too much of, or more than a little bit too much of over the last four decades with other digital technologies, or are we going to try to find ways of making workers more productive, more empowered? I think that discussion is still not central. Dara, may I ask you, um, what countries do you think get that balance correct? I, um, I, are, are there, in terms of a regulatory framework or the influence or balance between, I mean, granted, mo most other countries don't have the, 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 um, the, the, the innovation engine that the United States does, but I'm curious, is there, is there a model here to, or is it, is it mostly kind of developing new models that don't yet exist? Yeah, no, there is no model. No. There's no model. Uh, but both the European Union and China are ahead of the United States in terms of regulation. And there are many reasons for us not to copy either. But there is a lot that we can learn from their experiences. In the case of the European Union, you know, they are cursed and blessed by the fact that they don't have major tech companies of the size of Google, Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft. That makes them less 
likely to be captured by these companies, both in reality and intellectually. I think intellectual capture is very important here as well. But it also makes them much farther from the center of gravity of the technology. So if you look at one landmark legislation from the EU, it was the general data protection uh, of data privacy regulation, GDPR, which I think had exactly the right emphasis at the right time. It had the right philosophical foundations of privacy and importance of consumer choice in their privacy as opposed to, you know, data being sort of a, a common resource leading to a tragedy of commons and protecting the individual in many different ways. And they were very swift in being able to pass a legislation, but it also backfired that because the type of regulatory questions that are facing us are very complex and we don't have experience with them. This is not the same as, you know, putting, uh, you know, seat belts in cars. So, so you have to experiment with it. You have to provide much greater scientific, academic, and policy uh, uh, precedent to 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 the legislators in order for them to be able to select the right type of thing. So, for example, in the GDPR, they didn't fully take into account how platforms can introduce pro forma privacy agreements and essentially compel users to say, "Okay, you can use all of my data." before they can proceed. And that was, you know, pretty effective against 98% of all users. And then there could be other ways in which they could get around those. So, so what you do is you don't conclude that regulation cannot work. You say, well, we'll we're going to tighten the regulation. We're going to soften it in some aspect. We're going to tighten it in other aspects. The other thing that is said is that technology is too complex today to be regulated. Well, China shows that's not the case. I mean, China, in a very draconian fashion, has now brought all sorts of tech companies under very tight regulation. I'm not in favor of what they're doing because it's part of their overall sort of monopolization of power in the hands of the Communist Party, but it shows it can be done. So what can we learn from that? I think there's a lot to be learned. I think the United States is fortunate to have Silicon Valley. It's been our engine of economic progress, uh, economic growth. The United States would not be as prosperous and as at much at the frontier today without Silicon Valley. But that doesn't mean that everything that the tech sector does is for the national interest or for the global interest. And I think increasingly we've seen that divergence. So we want to celebrate and protect that environment for innovation, risk taking, creativity, while at the same time providing the right set of incentives and the right sort of guardrails against it. And I want to just return briefly also to uh, the the power of unions. You've, you've pointed out that the Nordic countries have a better model for productive trade union negotiation. And I wonder if you can describe um, how that model works different from other places, perhaps, especially here in the U.S. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, let me preface that by saying, why do I talk of unions? I think, you know, one way of understanding that is to go not to the Biden uh, tech company deal, but the previous uh, hearings or the previous big event uh, on, in DC where you know uh, the, the CEOs of several tech companies met with the senators and that was about the future of generative AI as well. And what was jarring is that it was the tech companies and the senators, but this was something that's gonna influence the future of the work of tens of millions, hundreds of millions of workers in the United States and many more beyond the US. And worker voice was completely absent. And that cannot be a healthy situation. I think some people are skeptical that this will have a big effect on work. Most people think it's going to have a big effect on work. There is a split. Something is positive, something something it's negative, something it can be made pos more positive, some conditional optimist, conditional pessimist. But it's clear that this is going to have most likely tremendous effects on inequality, work, wages, the nature of what people do with their uh, with daily activities. And not having worker voice there is not acceptable. So we have to find some organization, some way of collective uh, workings for the people who earn their living in the labor market 
to have a say about what they feel about the future of this technology and how that can be steered in a somewhat more beneficial direction for them. Unions are one way of playing that role. In the United States, unfortunately, it has not been as successful. There are very many reasons for that. And the contrast with the Nordic countries, I think, is a good way of understanding that. If you look at the Nordic countries, the system that emerged in the 1930s in Sweden, Norway, and then uh, Denmark and Finland, uh, sort of uh, in various ways uh, built on that, it is very cooperative. Sometimes it's used corporatist model. So it's big unions and representatives of the business community with some participation from the government. And some people don't like that corporatist element. But I think it is a very important foundation for a cooperative relationship. So unions are not there to destroy companies, and dis companies are not there to destroy unions. I think that's a first very important step. The second is at the industry level. So when you negotiate with, a, with, a, with, with, a, with an organization that, present, that represents workers in your establishment, in your business unit. As a manager, as an owner, your tendency is always to be a little bit harder against them because that's going to mean better competitive advantage for you relative to your rivals. When it's at the industry level, that more conflictual element is avoided. It also creates a much better sort of industry level coverage so, uh, so it's not tied to what's going on in one business unit versus another. In the United States, both of those important elements are not present. It's a much more conflictual relationship. Most managers see the unions as the most troublesome thing that could happen to them. Many union leaders uh, see themselves as diametrically opposed, sometimes mortally opposed to the managers and the bosses. And that doesn't breed a kind of cooperative relationship. And industry level bargains are banned in the United States. So, so that really creates a problem. But it is also critical to understand that whatever organization is going to uh, represent workers, part of the bargain and part of the conversation has to be about technology. And we have precedents from the Nordic countries, from Germany, and from some unusual or unique circumstances in the United States when that happened, that this sort of conversation over technology is much more productive. And quite frankly, we need it. Like This is something that people in the progressive left don't understand. You know, Today, you cannot just say, oh, we're going to push for higher minimum wages, and that's going to bring prosperity to workers. If in today's technological environment, you increase the minimum wage, what many employers will do is just go and automate even more. Labor has become more, more expensive. Uh, why should we put up with it when there are so many options to eliminate workers and there aren't the technologies to make workers more productive? So really the conversation has to be, sure, we want higher wages, but we also want to create the organizational forms and the technologies, especially related to AI, to make these workers more productive so that employers want to hold on to them, actually want to train them, want to build their future growth plans on them. Yeah, very interesting. And I, you know, I, I can't help but think I was uh, in Los Angeles last last week and uh, met with a number of executives uh, across various aspects of Hollywood. And right now, as you know, of course, there's a a, a strike going on both among the uh, writers and then they also the actors uh, adding to it. And it strikes me a, as a rare example of unions reflecting on the uh, the the existential nature potentially of what's to come. As a result of generative AI and the and, and its impact on the creative process, and uh, and you, you, one might certainly argue successfully that it's an unusual combination of of unions that can come together in order to stop a very powerful uh, industry. Um, but it, it but but nevertheless, it, it actually is a pause of sorts that's happened uh, as a result of um, you know a, the the worker, so to say, um, highlighting. The necessity for additional thought as to what future uh, they wish to live in and, and operate in. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. I've written on the uh, the the Hollywood strike uh, together with Simon Johnson in an L.A. Times op-ed very early on, and uh, and I I you know today another month passed since then. I think it's even more important than what we emphasized in that op-ed. 
it's the first postmodern strike, and I don't mean it in the bad sense of the postmodern, the good sense of postmodern. It's really a strike about the use of AI and how AI will be used, what direction it will take. And it is very important because, you know, what generative AI will do is most relevant for knowledge workers. It actually will have impacts and can have very positive effects on blue collar workers for tradespeople, and we can talk about that. But it will have its perhaps most formative effects on knowledge workers, white collar workers. And there is no other group within that knowledge, that economy, than the writers and actors that have the power to negotiate its terms. And the Writers Guild understood that part of the problem is about technology, streaming technology. I think that's important, but even more importantly about AI and who controls data, creative data. I have created something unique. Who has the rights to that? How can you incorporate that into the large language models? And if you incorporate it and generate something new out of it, whose labor was it? Was it just the labor and the creativity of those people who designed the large language model? Also my creativity, because it's my creation that was an input into it. And so those are going to be critical. It's also absolutely critical. Perhaps the Writers Guild is not emphasizing this as much. But how can we use generative AI to make our screenwriters, our directors more productive? Are we investing enough in that sort of generative AI? I think that's going to be another critical thing. And I think the biggest danger here is that studios are going to make a deal to actors and writers guild that's generous in terms of wages and salaries, but will want to keep complete control of the creative data and the techno, the future of technology. And I think that will be really bad because if the writers guild cannot influence how generative AI will be used, no other knowledge economy group of workers will be able to do it. So this is why it's actually a very, very pivotal moment, I think, in the future of the knowledge economy and the future of generative AI. Yeah, very interesting. And, and let me, you talk about the um, the potential impact of generative AI and making writers more productive. You are a writer, writer of books, writer of articles, as we've talked about in this conversation. Uh, you guide uh, writers and future writers uh, who are your students as well. I, I wonder if you can uh, talk a bit about your own um, excitement or worry uh, when it comes to the impact of this on your own work? To how do you see um, with the next book that you're perhaps you're even at work at it now? I don't know, but as you think about the next work, uh, ne next book that you put together, um, how it might be different as a result of the advances here. Thank you, thank you, Peter. But if I may, can I take a step back, please? In please do. this question. Yes, because what I want to do is actually explain one other perspective that we advocate in the book and then answer it within that context. So in the same way that, you know, the less Epsis vision was opposed to others who thought of more workable plans in the Panama, I think the way that we guide the future of digital technologies is also a battle of visions. And in the book, we say that there are two polar visions that have been influential and have been pulling digital technologies and today AI in different directions. One is going back to Turing and other sort of luminaries of the field, arguing that, you know, we should strive for autonomous machine intelligence. So there, just the ability of machines to do human-like tasks is an objective in and of itself. That vision is very powerful. It sort of integrates very well with Hollywood movies. It integrates very well with our spiritual sort of ideas about powerful machines going back to the ancient Greek times. And it has had some workable implications. But I find an alternative vision that was articulated by people like Norbert Wiener, Douglas Engelbart, J.C.R. Licklider, that machines are there to be useful to humans. And we should strive for creating usable, useful, understandable machines and always judge them in terms of their contributions to what it enables us as humans to do. And I think I think those two visions have pushed technology in different directions and their conflict has sometimes been very productive. That 
certain advances have come from the machine intelligence view and then many important ones including you know all the things that we take for granted today hypertext uh workable screens uh mouse came out of the machine usefulness sort of vision but over time especially with the rise of ai the autonomous machine intelligence vision has become very powerful and that is i think is a guiding light for much of what we are seeing in generative ai I think in that capacity, generative AI will have some impressive achievements, but it will not realize its full potential. So I don't see generative AI being super useful to me unless more of that machine usefulness vision is integrated into it. I've used GPT-4 from the very early days, even before it was uh, uh, sort of launched, thanks to uh, people who offered for me to use it. It's very impressive. I was blown away in some ways. But for my work, for example, for me to get references and so on, it does not, does not have the reliability and the subtlety and the anchoring to truth that would be necessary for many knowledge work. And it is too much based on its own specific architectural shortcomings, uh, which is you know just a pure predictive tool without a holistic understanding of the context in which it is operating, which would be much more useful for many specific expert-led occupations, such as you know, journalists, professors, screenwriters. So those are the kinds of things. Can we push generative AI more in that direction? And uh, is it feasible? And is it easy to do the developments in that way in the industry? And if we do that, can we encourage many employers, including Hollywood studios, to employ them in a way that will be more useful for uh, for their for their workers? And if the answer to that is yes, I think that's also very much parallel to what I can use it for and what my students can use it for. So we already use many AI-related techniques, for example, in natural language processing, many, much more data is uh, now available from historical text because of natural language processing, but that's very much an example of a fairly uh, uh, simple set of ideas, very powerfully applied in a way that's going to be useful for humans. It's like for humans to acquire more reliable knowledge from the past. Can we use generative AI that way? For example, can the next version of GPT, you know, uh, be a tool for journalists or researchers to say, give me uh, the relevant information before my interview or before my research with the right sort of reliability assessment and no hallucination and uh, and and with the right references uh, so that I can follow up on them, but I'm much better prepared to, uh, to do my next interview or I'm much more knowledgeable about the literature before I start writing a paper or an essay. I think those are simple but very powerful ways in which generative AI can be used, but it's very similarly to this sort of machine usefulness vision. It's anchor, it should be anchored at making things more doable for humans. Or a different way of saying it is that today, even before generative AI, we have all of the information or most of the information that you can imagine on the internet, but we don't have a reliable way of filtering it, understanding what's reliable, retrieving it in the right way. But that's a human problem. So can we make generative AI useful to humans to be better, better decision makers in a range of tasks? How much do you worry, Daron, about generative AI as a as being a destroyer of jobs, uh, of of the the kind of work you talked about, both uh, white collar work, as you put it, uh, but also uh, I guess traditionally blue collar work uh, that that may have risks associated with it, given the the speed of the progress uh, that's happening here. Um, you know, another another aspect of your your work in this this uh, profound book that you you've written is again the the sweep of history and the extent to which uh, technology has the ability to uh, create tremendous advances but also change the nature of work. Um, how do you see that uh, happening here in the near or medium term relative to the advances in generative AI? Again, let me preface that to, by reiterating something I, I I ended my previous answer to. I think generative AI has tremendous progress, not to be a job destroyer but a job helper. I gave you the examples from knowledge work, but the same is true for blue collar work. I think, for example, uh, the US and many other industrialized nations have a shortage of electricians and plumbers. And a shortage of these very, very valuable skills 
is going to get much deeper. For example, if we even make a half-hearted attempt to electrify the grid, we're going to need many more electricians. The problem is we are not valuing these jobs and we're not training enough people. And once we train them, the problems are becoming more complex and we're not really bringing them to the frontier of the problems. Generative AI can be tremendously useful. So imagine that we can use generative AI for improving the training of electricians and make that job much more valuable, much more high status, and also give generative AI tools to electricians for their just-in-time real dynamic recognition of a diagnosis of problems, uh, especially as they're going to be encountering more and more diverse problems with a more complexly changing electrical grid. So you don't have to go and say, oh, well, I don't know what's going on here. Another colleague of mine has to come and uh, and somebody more experienced has to come and they're not going to be able to work it out. Now you can draw on the experience of thousands of other electricians in the real time to recognize and diagnose and, and, and try to troubleshoot the problem. So I think that the, the, the possibilities are endless using generative AI. So there's nothing in the nature of the technology that should be a job destroyer. That being said, I am very worried about it being a job destroyer because that's the low road. And what we are seeing from the Hollywood studios, what we're seeing from BuzzFeed, what we're seeing from the ad industry and what we're seeing from many office jobs is that that's going to be the most natural tendency. And the fact that many of these large language models are not targeting the human complementarity and they are coming with this hype of machine intelligence, autonomy, human-like reasoning is going to make that low road of automation and instead of human complementarity, instead of creating new tasks, that, that danger is going to be even more relevant. So I am very worried. And, you know, robots, for example, industrial robots have been a tremendous advance. They have improved production, productivity, quality in many industries, but they've had very negative effects on blue collar workers who used to perform the tasks that robots are doing. And that wasn't like a huge number of workers because the United States had already deindustrialized. And uh, and probably there were at most a couple of million workers who were directly affected by robots and 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 some fraction of them lost their jobs and many of them experienced stagnant incomes. If you look at generative AI type tools, the number of workers who could be affected is much, much higher. So if we go in the rote automation direction, there is a danger that it could be very negative. And you know what's worse? When you overemphasize automation, you don't even get the promised benefits. This is what Pascual Restrepo and I and Simon and I call so-so automation. You do the automation, but it's, ah, it's just like, automated customer service. It's not that good. So you don't get the productivity benefits. You don't get the cost reductions. All you do is displace workers. Perhaps bosses and companies make a little bit more money, but the social benefits are very limited. Yeah, the fascinating perspectives. Uh, thank you, Daron. I, you alluded uh, earlier in a, in a different response to, to China, uh, and I wanted to return to, um, uh, to re return to that country uh, noting that, you know, China has obviously put governors on the full power of the internet, limiting what citizens can see, for example, uh, and presumably uh, has the same plans in mind for generative AI as it advances, putting those same governors in place. And, and I wonder, you know, what, what do you believe to be the consequences or implications of that? Um, you know, it, it, it has done so uh, with, with uh, information sharing of various kinds, and yet, economic expansion until recently has been formidable. Um, obviously, we see there, there's a, a lot of layers to this. I realize a, a complex uh, question that also talks about consolidation of power and uh, the increased authority of somebody like Xi as he now has uh, ended term limits and so on. But you know, as you think about uh, generative AI, it, at its best, perhaps, it's the sort of thing that provide, it elevates the point at which uh, we are engaged. That it is providing information for us. It is uh, maybe uh, you know from a variety of different sources that allows us perhaps to test hypotheses along the way and so forth. Uh, there's so much about that that is uh, would be viewed as a threat to to the Chinese government. And I wonder, you know, if you have any perspectives on uh, on that very fact. Yeah, well, I, I've I've thought a lot about China. Uh, James Robinson and I wrote 
about China starting in Why Nations Fail more than 10 years ago. We uh, explored some aspects of China's historical development and future in terms of technology and governance in our next book, The Narrow Corridor. And China features heavily in power and progress as well. And there are many things to say. I don't want to belabor it too much. But first of all, the argument that we are in a existential struggle with China, and hence we cannot regulate AI because then China would surge ahead. I think that perspective is completely wrong. First of all, China is regulating AI much more than we are. And the United States is still far ahead of China, except in a few areas such as facial recognition, where there is more greater parity. So there's a lot of room for US to play a regulatory leadership. So that China competition view is not is not right. Second, I think uh you know, China has a special interest in AI. And to understand that, we have to go back to the other aspect of your question. You know, very rapid growth, but still the monopoly of power in the hands of the Chinese Communist Party. How is that feasible? I think part of the reason why that has become tenable over the last decade is because you know, under President Xi especially, the Communist Party decided that they were going to fuel economic growth and innovation, but at the same time, put a break on the aspirations and voice of the rising middle class. And to do that, one of the tools that they relied on very heavily was digital censorship. So many of the things that initially people thought were forces of informational liberation, social media, the internet, blogs, became tools under the control of the Chinese Communist Party for indoctrination and really, uh, and, and, and extinguishing any type of uh, informational freedom. And that is the reason why China is on a par with the United States when it comes to facial recognition, because that's one of the technologies that they invested in a lot in order to uh, secure social control. And that's the way that they are approaching AI. But I don't think it's permanently tenable. <clears throat> but you have to live with China. And I think you have to accept that that's the way they're going to use this new technology. And I think we have to accept that the regime is not going to fall overnight, but I think there's going to be more and more ten tension even with their uh, heavy investment in, uh, in, 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 in information control. But I think the short-term implication is that we shouldn't expect generative AI to be a powerful engine of liberation in, in China. But there's going to be a lot of investment in generative AI in China, but they're behind the United States. So that, again, provides a greater room for regulatory maneuver in the United States. Well, Daron Asimoglu, thank you for a an expansive conversation, only partially representative of your many areas of expertise and curiosity. Uh, it, it's a, a great pleasure to have this conversation with you and to mine your insights relative to some very important topics. Uh, thank you so much for a terrific conversation. Thank you for having me on your program, Peter. It's been a really delightful conversation. Thank you.